Welcome to the Culture of Healthcare, Privacy, Confidentiality, and Security. This is Lecture A. The component, The Culture of Healthcare, addresses job expectations in healthcare settings. It discusses how care is organized within a practice setting, privacy laws, and professional and ethical issues encountered in the workplace. The objectives for privacy, confidentiality, and security are to define and discern the differences between privacy, confidentiality, and security, discuss methods for using information technology to protect privacy and confidentiality, describe and apply privacy, confidentiality, and security under the tenets of the HIPAA privacy and security rules, discuss the intersection of a patient's right to privacy with the need to share and exchange patient information. This unit defines important terms related to privacy, confidentiality, and security. It discusses reasons for concerns about privacy and security in the context of health information. Tools for protecting health information are examined, followed by a discussion of the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, regulations, and what additions have been made in the High Tech, or Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act, legislation. Privacy is the individual's right to keep information to himself or herself. It is the right to be left alone, the right to keep personal information secret, and, in essence, the right to control personal information. Confidentiality, by contrast, is the individual's right to keep information about himself or herself from being disclosed to other people. When a patient vests confidentiality in a physician and a healthcare system, it is expected that personal information is kept confidential and not disclosed to others. Data is shared or disseminated only to those with a need to know. Security is the activity of protecting personal information. It consists of mechanisms to assure the safety of data and the systems in which the data reside. Security should address the physical security of the buildings, equipment, and storage media, as well as the data and informational assets retained by all healthcare organizations. Individually Identifiable Health Information, or IIHI, is any data that can be correlated with an individual. For example, information in a medical record or a database that can be linked to a specific patient. A related term is protected health information, or PHI, which is defined as individually identifiable health information. The HIPAA Privacy Rule defines individually identifiable health information as a subset of health information, including demographic and other health information related to past, present, or future physical or mental health or condition of an individual that is created or received by a health care provider, health plan, employer, or health care clearinghouse. Finally, consent is a broad term, but it is defined here in the context of privacy. When consent is given to the healthcare provider organization and or physician, it entails written or verbal permission to allow use of individually identifiable health information for the activity of providing health care or for participation in a research project or related activity. The remainder of this lecture focuses on concerns about privacy and security, beginning with the notion of personal privacy versus the common good. The discussion continues regarding disclosures of personal health information, examining some of the concerns that the public has about the privacy of health information. Finally, the lecture closes with a few comments about de-identified data. Consider the notion of personal privacy versus the common good. Some of the concerns are well demonstrated in a video that was produced in 2011 by the American Civil Liberties Union, which is available on YouTube at youtube.be slash 33 capital C capital I capital V lowercase j lowercase v capital Y lowercase y capital E lowercase k. In this video, a pizza restaurant has access to customers' medical information, and they penalize them for things like ordering extra cheese when their cholesterol levels are shown to be high. It is a video worth watching, even though it takes a very specific point of view. There's a broad spectrum of views on personal privacy versus the common good, often reflecting underlying political beliefs. At one end of the spectrum is the view that although personal privacy is important, there are some instances when the common good of society outweighs personal privacy. An example that is often given is biosurveillance, whether it is monitoring emerging natural diseases or things like bioterrorism. Early intervention and response is possible with more information. 
Another example is clinical research. When more clinical research is conducted, the ability to provide quality health care is increased. The other end of the spectrum holds that personal privacy trumps everything, that there should really be no reason to violate a person's privacy without explicit consent. Others have called for a more balanced approach between personal privacy and the common good. For more information on this topic, some good articulations can be found in documents from the California Healthcare Foundation, an editorial by Dr. Don Detmer, and a policy paper from the American College of Physicians. As with many ethical issues, there are no explicitly right or wrong answers, and each individual has to decide where their views fall on the spectrum. However, the U.S. political process, not the individual, will more than likely determine how personal privacy and common good in terms of health care are balanced. It is important to know about patient information disclosure and how to prevent it from happening in the future. Disclosures occur due to a variety of reasons, including mobile devices or data storage media that is lost or stolen, as well as cybersecurity attacks on an organization's technology infrastructure. Not all cybersecurity attacks result in patient information disclosure, but any threat of an actual attack or breach places the organization at high risk. Also, hackers may not reveal they have stolen the information until long after the event. Healthcare providers are a prime target for cyber attacks due in part to the value of PHI on the black market. Anyone can be subject to a breach, including healthcare providers, vendors, insurance companies, patients, and consumers. The increasing use of mobile devices such as smartphones, tablets, and laptops poses unique issues with the effort of protecting both physical and data assets. Any device that connects to a network is vulnerable, including medical devices. Also, implantable devices such as pacemakers are prone to hackers. This slide provides just a sampling of the many types of events that can result in disclosure of PHI. These examples range from 2005 to 2016, which demonstrates this is not a recent issue. One particularly egregious story happened in Portland, Oregon on New Year's Eve 2005. An individual left in his car discs, backup tapes, and other media that contained records of about 365,000 patients who were seen by a visiting nurse association. This indiscretion naturally received a lot of press and demonstrated the need to be careful if one manages devices with PHI. This type of event has continued to occur over the years regardless of the amount of press. The Veterans Administration system has had a number of episodes, probably the largest of which was when a laptop with the data of over a million veterans was stolen. The laptop was recovered, and it appeared that the data was not accessed. But of course, no one knows exactly what went on with the machine when it was in the hands of those who stole it. Improper disclosure of research participants, PHI, resulted in a HIPAA settlement in 2016. Anthem, a large insurance payer organization, was hacked exposing over 80 million customers PHI. Over the past several years, many healthcare providers have had their clinical and operational software systems and networks frozen until some type of ransom was paid. These events do not necessarily expose PHI, but they demonstrate the organization's vulnerability and place their PHI at high risk. Again, these are only a few of the many examples of breaches, attacks, and loss of PHI impacting healthcare organizations, providers, and their patients. Two websites are devoted to documentation of disclosures. The Privacy Rights Clearinghouse provides a searchable chronology of data breaches. The data includes medical breaches but is not limited to them. The site can be accessed at www.privacyrights.org slash data dash breach. The Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, is required under the High Tech Act to post a list of breaches of unsecured PHI affecting 500 or more individuals. It is called by some their wall of shame. It can be accessed at ocrportal.hhs.gov slash OCR slash breach slash breach underscore report dot JSF. This website contains a running list of all report breaches. The top 10 data breaches in 2015 accounted for over 111 million records, with the top six breaches impacting 1 million individuals. The Ponemon Institute publishes an annual report on the impact of security breaches on healthcare organizations. The 2015 report estimated that data breaches may, quote, 
be costing the industry $6 billion. More than 90% of healthcare organizations represented in this study had a data breach, and 40% had more than five data breaches over the past two years. End quote. From the Ponemon Institute, 2015. According to the study, the average cost of a data breach for healthcare organizations is estimated to be more than $2.1 million. A significant part of the cost was lost business by the organization. For the first time, criminal attacks were the number one cause of data breaches in healthcare in 2015, according to the study. Criminal attacks on healthcare organizations are up 125% compared to five years ago. In fact, 45% of healthcare organizations say the root cause of the data breach was a criminal attack, and 12% say it was due to a malicious insider. Half of all organizations indicated that they have little or no confidence in their ability to detect all patient data loss or theft. The HIMSS 2015 Security Survey identified the sources for breaches as the following. Foreign sources, hacktivist, nation-state actor, malicious insider, hacker, social engineering, and online scam artist. Interestingly, this threat has not impacted the security budgets for healthcare providers. The HIMSS report identified that healthcare providers spend, on average, less than 6% of their IT budget for security expenditures, even though security is a top business priority. In contrast, the federal government spends 16% of its IT budget on security, while financial and banking institutions spend 12 to 15%. Defenses are not keeping pace with the volume of attacks and the new trends and methods of threats and breaches. Security challenges are created with the proliferation of health IT technologies and software applications. For example, there is an ever-growing use of electronic data in clinical workflows and use of technology by all healthcare providers. Likewise, Health Information Exchange, or HIE, and data sharing activities across multiple networks and cloud computing greatly expands the required perimeter of data protection. Financial constraints often result in shrinking technology budgets, which presents another point of potential vulnerability for the healthcare organization because it becomes more difficult to monitor and quickly respond to threats. Patient and family engagement activities are increasing as they become more involved in their care using their own various devices and applications. There are also new models of healthcare, such as accountable care organizations, or ACOs, and care transitions, which is care across the patient care continuum, that require more members of a care team to access information. Clinicians also want to use their devices, such as personal laptops, tablet devices, smartphones, and so forth. This causes increased use of cellular and other wireless networks, which may be vulnerable if not properly encrypted thus threatening security of medical devices and implantable devices. And of course, technology itself can worsen the problem. A widely cited study by Wright looked at the USB drives, sometimes called thumb drives, commonly plugged into computers. These drives run a program that enables their use when they are plugged in, and that program can be modified to extract data from the computer. So if that computer has personal health information on it, the thumb drive can basically copy it from the computer. Some personal health record systems and other consumer-targeted health applications may or may not have encryption functionality and could be easily compromised. Another interesting analysis found that 10% of hard drives sold by second-hand retailers in Canada had remnants of personal health information on them. Often, when computers are disposed of, the hard drives are not completely wiped clean, potentially providing access to personal information for the next user, if that user knows how to extract it. This applies to both patient and consumer mobile devices and computers, as well as equipment owned by healthcare organizations. Also of note is that PHI can be discovered by files available from peer-to-peer, -peer, or P2P, file sharing networks. One analysis found that half of 1% of all IP addresses on the Internet in the United States have discoverable PHI. Finally, another technology that can store PHI is the digital photocopier, which stores all copies on an internal hard disk. If this information is compromised, PHI can potentially be leaked. Fax machines and scanners may also store data that can include PHI. A rule of thumb is to restrict physical access when possible and always encrypt. 
Physical access includes access to hardware devices, but also the physical area where computers, servers, and network equipment are housed. There are many challenges facing healthcare organizations in preparing and maintaining proper security measures. These are just a few. Security budgets are not keeping pace with the complex technology environments and the growing risk of attacks. This limits the ability of healthcare organizations to address proper security measures. The significant increase in threats and the growing sophistication level of attacks have created a situation in which providers cannot keep up an adequate offensive front. There's a need for more innovative advanced security tools and in-depth approaches to keep pace with security threats and vulnerabilities. There's not enough qualified and skilled security expertise. Slightly more than half, 53%, of organizations have personnel with the necessary technical expertise to be able to identify and resolve data breaches involving the unauthorized access, loss, or theft of patient data. Paper remains an issue. 54% of respondents indicate security incidents occurred involving paper documents, with most involving less than 100 PHI records. Data leakage is a primary threat with identity, and access management is a top priority. Not all organizations have nor can afford a full-time Chief Information Security Officer, or CISO. This role is primarily found in larger organizations, while smaller organizations may include these job duties with another position. One question to ask is, what is the role of government in protecting privacy and confidentiality? This discussion begins by looking at the United States and then moves to other countries. There are many state and federal level activities focused on privacy and security of PHI and data sharing. Under high tech, two committees were formed, an HIT policy committee and an HIT standards committee. Two groups under these two committees focus on privacy and security. The Privacy and Security Work Group, working under the HIT Policy Committee, provides input and makes recommendations on policy issues and opportunities to ensure that electronic data captured and exchanged is protected and shared only by means consistent with consumer needs and expectations. The API Task Force, working under the Health IT Joint Committee Collaboration, identifies both perceived and real privacy and security concerns that are barriers to widespread adoption of open APIs in healthcare. Please visit the URL on the slide, which is a flowchart depicting ONC's Federal Advisory Committee process for developing recommendations. www.healthit.gov slash FACAS slash sites slash FACA slash files slash develop dash recommendations dash SOP dot PDF. Several previous federally supported groups have produced many publications that focus on privacy and security. These include HISPC, which focused on multi-state harmonization, and the Privacy and Security Tiger Team, which developed policies and recommendations. Publications from these groups and others are found on the www.healthit.gov website. The National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics, or NCVHS, has weighed in over the years on a number of privacy and security issues with various publications and recommendations for policies concerning health privacy. Another example is the 2015 Precision Medicine Initiative. This initiative specifically provided ONC $5 million to support development of interoperability standards and requirements addressing privacy and enabling secure data exchange. Most federal agencies are involved in privacy and security, including the Office of the Inspector General, or OIG, Office of Civil Rights, OCR, Federal Trade Commission, FTC, Food and Drug Administration, FDA, Federal Communications Commission, FCC, Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, and Department of Justice, DOJ. The eHealth Exchange, previously the Nationwide Health Information Network, is a network of exchange partners located across the United States who securely share clinical information over the Internet using a standardized approach. One hallmark of the eHealth Exchange is the Data Use and Reciprocal Support Agreement, or DERSA, which all participants must adhere to and which ensures secure data exchange. 
In addition, states are very involved in supporting effective privacy and security policies and activities, including creation of new laws for their states and working with other states to create and maintain an environment of secured interstate activities and commerce. The United States is not the only government that has been addressing privacy and security activities. In January 2012, the European Commission proposed a comprehensive reform of data protection rules in the European Union, or EU, with the objective of giving back to citizens control over their personal data and to simplify the regulatory environment for business. The data protection reform is a key enabler of the digital single market. Under EU law, personal data can be gathered legally only under strict conditions for a legitimate purpose. Furthermore, persons or organizations that collect and manage personal information must protect it from misuse and must respect certain rights of the data owners, which are guaranteed by EU law. The belief driving this initiative is that everyone has the right to the protection of personal data. In February 2016, the European Commission finalized the, quote, Reform of EU Data Protection Rules, which apply to all companies providing services on the EU market. The Commission negotiated the EU-US Umbrella Agreement, ensuring high data protection standards for data transfers across the Atlantic for law enforcement purposes. The Commission achieved a renewed sound framework for commercial data exchange, the EU-US Privacy Shield. End quote. The United States will publish written commitments in the U.S. Federal Register and assurance on the safeguards and limitations concerning public authorities' access to data. Previously, the European Commission devoted efforts to the protection of individual privacy. The 2007 Directive 95-46-EC provided a set of fairly stringent rules that essentially allows data processing only with consent or in some highly specific circumstances, such as a legal obligation, or what is defined as a public necessity, usually revolving around public health. These are just examples of what other governments are doing around privacy and security. There are a number of related issues for medical privacy. Ownership of health information is complex and varies from state to state. Additionally, court decisions may relate to health information in one state, but not apply to health information from other states. In general, the person or organization that holds the record is considered to be the owner of the information. Once health information has been given to a provider or organization, patients have rights to access and copy their health information, but are not considered to own the information. A comparison of state policies on medical record ownership is available at www.healthinfolaw.org slash comparative dash analysis slash who dash owns dash medical dash records dash 50 dash state dash comparison. For example, if an office practice or hospital had paper charts and had bought and owned the paper the charts were printed on, it was presumed that the practice or hospital owned the information on that paper. However, in the electronic era, information moves freely across networks from one system to another, and ownership of that information becomes less clear. As the amount of information increases, there's an increased economic value to healthcare providers, pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, research institutions, and others who may want to use that data for various purposes. The article by Rodwin, in particular, argues that when there is an economic advantage gained by the use of that information, then at least some of that gain should be shared back to the patient. Another concern is compelled disclosures of information. That is, even though laws and regulations may highly protect information, individuals may sometimes be compelled to disclose information for non-clinical care reasons in the healthcare setting. Employers, insurance companies, and even government agencies sometimes require people to sign authorizations releasing their health information for various purposes. Healthcare providers need to be aware of requiring individuals to disclose information that is not really being used for health-related activities. Another growing issue concerns the human genome, which may be a person's ultimate personal identifier. A person's genome is what makes each person an individual. Individual genes and the variation that they have from others' genes are unequivocally unique to each person. Health information can be de-identified, but with genomic information, individuals may be easily identifiable. Access to the genomic information manifests itself in a number of ways. 
For example, a person's genome can be identified by the genomic information in his or her siblings. There are a growing number of genome-wide association studies that attempt to associate variation in an individual's genome with different diseases. There's actually a requirement for researchers to put this data in public data banks, although usually the individual personal information is protected and is available only to the researchers, who can legitimately access it. It is not too difficult to identify an individual from genomic data, so as research moves forward with genomics and personalized medicine, more privacy issues will come to the fore. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008 was enacted as a mechanism to ensure that genetic information is not used to discriminate against an individual in health insurance and employment settings. Another number of organizations have tried to define health information rights. One example is the Declaration of Health Data Rights, which comes from a group of mostly personal health record, or PHR, vendors. This group advocates that all individuals should have the right to their own health data. They should also have the right to know the source of each health data element. In addition, individuals should have the right to take possession of a complete copy of their individual health data without delay at minimal or no cost. If data exists in computable form, it must be made available in that form. Finally, individuals should have the right to share their health data with others as they see fit. The American Health Information Management Association, or AHIMA, also has a Health Information Bill of Rights that is slightly more detailed but has similar provisions. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, or HIPAA, the privacy rule includes provisions for patients' health information privacy rights. These include the right to access health information, right to an accounting of disclosures of health information, right to correct or amend health information, right to notice of privacy practices, and right to file a complaint. More information can be found at www.healthit.gov slash patients dash families slash your dash health dash information dash rights. The Privacy Right Clearinghouse also provides information on HIPAA's privacy rule at www.privacyrights.org slash content slash HIPAA dash privacy dash rule dash patients dash rights. When data is referred to as being de-identified, it means that personally identifying characteristics of the data, such as name or address, or other fields that make up personal health information have been removed. Is de-identification secure? It may not always be as secure as intended. Sweeney brought this to light and has received notice in the popular press. When she was completing her Ph.D. at MIT, she did a widely cited study that essentially identified William Weld, the governor of Massachusetts at the time, through information found by linking to publicly available data sources. Her research also showed that 87% of the U.S. population could be uniquely identified by their five-digit zip code, gender, and date of birth. So, when relatively common data elements are combined, individual identities may be easily identified. In the case of William Weld, Sweeney was able to access a health insurance database for state employees, and Governor Weld was obviously a state employee. Sweeney also was able to purchase the voter registration list for the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, where the governor lived. She then combined these two databases, linking the zip code, gender, and date of birth, and was able to identify the governor, as will be demonstrated further in the next slide. Just as genomic data generated in clinical research studies may make individuals identifiable, some recent research has shown how social security numbers of individuals can be predicted from public data because so many data sets contain social security numbers. This slide demonstrates how Governor Weld was identified. On the left is the so-called de-identified state employee health database, which included state employees' ethnicity, visits to health care providers, diagnoses, procedures, medications, and charges. It also contained zip codes, dates of birth, and gender. The Cambridge Voter Registration Database included name, address, registered party affiliation, and the same zip codes, dates of birth, and gender. Governor Weld was one of those 87% who had a unique combination of zip code, date of birth, and gender. 
Sweeney took Weld's voter registration information and then accessed his entire medical information. This concludes Lecture A of Privacy, Confidentiality, and Security. In summary, it's important to distinguish privacy, which is the right to keep information to yourself, from confidentiality, which is the right to keep information about yourself from being disclosed to others. For many reasons, breaches and disclosures of patient information are increasing. In addition, the concept of de-identified information is not necessarily as secure as originally thought.